it's a pleasure to present to you um, this morning and discuss with you the um, most important takeaways, I think, from our um, presentations, both at ASCO and EHAR at both plenary sessions. Um, I'm going to focus on, on obviously, the ASCO plenary session where we were able to um, provide uh, primary results for um, the determination trial, a very large phase three effort um, conducted across the United States from starting point in 2010 um, to reporting final mature data uh, in 2022. So 12 years in the making. Uh, and obviously that's reflective, I think, of the tremendous progress uh, made in the treatment of multiple myeloma in the newly diagnosed um, patient population. And this particular study sought to evaluate um, the impact of autologous stem cell transplant in the setting of uh, highly efficacious triplet therapy in the form of lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, so-called RVD, and very importantly, the role of lenalidomide maintenance given until progression um, in, in this particular setting. And obviously, uh, it's my privilege to be the PI of the study, and I serve as the RJ Coleman Professor of Medicine at uh, Harvard Medical School and also the Clinical Program Leader and Director of Clinical Research at the Jerome Lipper Myeloma Center at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. But I just want to especially acknowledge my co-investigators and all the centers, 56 in all, uh, as well as above all, um, our patients and their families um, for their participation in the trial. The background for the determination study is uh, summarized here. Um, our question was really, how much does autologous stem cell transplant add uh, in terms of clinical benefit um, to um, the rapidly evolving space of novel therapies used in combination in the upfront setting? And when we designed this trial, um, the front runners in that regard were, of course, the triplets. Uh, and specifically, we chose lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone because there we had established its efficacy uh, in a pivotal phase uh, one, two trial where we had 100% response rate um, to the combination approach. And at the same time, our French partners in the intergroup francophone myelome had shown very nicely that when you combined RVD with autologous stem cell transplant, you also got excellent results. Now, very importantly in the French study, um, lenalidomide maintenance was given only for one year in their large parallel trial to ours. In ours, in contrast, we chose to continue treatment until progression and or intolerance. And the critical reason for that was a regulatory one. In France, there was a concern that lenalidomide might contribute to second primaries, and therefore one year would be uh, the maximum that they would allow. Fortunately, in the United States, with the collaboration of the FDA, we had very nice data from the Alliance study, the CLGB 10104 trial led by my colleague Phil McCarthy, where we had shown that lenalidomide until progression after transplant resulted in really substantial clinical benefit. So our trial built in lenalidomide until uh, progression. Now, as we think about high dose melphalan, it's been an incredibly important platform in newly diagnosed younger eligible patients, and it's been a standard of care for some time. And so the question was with the introduction of triplets, what was the interaction there? Could we enhance clinical benefit? And above all, could we also show that long term maintenance therapy could even further improve disease control? Um, now, another fundamental question in the trial design was by giving transplant early versus transplant late. If we could keep transplant in reserve, would that be a challenge? Would that be a problem uh, in terms of, of long-term clinical benefit? And this was a critical question and an integral part of the study design. So this is actually the study design that summarized and gives you also a, a, a feeling of patient disposition. Um, we actually uh, enrolled 729 patients to begin treatment uh, uh, with their first cycle of RVD. Um, we actually then subsequently assigned patients 722 strong to either arm A, which was RVD given alone with stem cell harvest and then transplant kept in reserve, but lenalidomide maintenance until progression. Very importantly, there were a total of eight cycles of RVD given in this setting. Conversely, for those assigned to early transplant, those patients would receive five uh, cycles of RVD in total, three before the transplant and two after, and then lenalidomide maintenance uh, until, again, progression. And the primary endpoint um, for our study was what we call progression-free survival, but a key secondary endpoint was overall survival. And when we gave lenalidomide maintenance, we gave it um, 10 milligrams per day 
for the first three months and then increased it to 15. And very importantly, because sometimes there's a little bit of confusion about the nature of the regimen, there are actually differences between, for example, VRD and RVD. RVD is classically lenalidomide, um, 25 milligrams given for 14 days, um, and then seven days of rest, bortezomib given uh, days one, four, eight, and 11. And very importantly, the steroids partnered with the bortezomib. So on the day of the bortezomib, the day after, that's the classical um, RBD regimen. And that's the one associated with 100% response rate and um, high quality responses too. So with that all as background, what were our results? Well, in terms of the efficacy, we were very pleased to see a striking gain in terms of progression-free survival, which we've shown here. So basically, if you look at this, you can see um, that the patients, the chances of patients being alive and free from disease progression after five years was approximately 56% for the transplant early group versus approximately 42% for the RVD alone. But what was really interesting and, and how this actually translated was approximately 46 months of disease control for RVD alone versus around 67 months of disease control um, for RVD with early transplant. What was fascinating, however, was that this did not affect overall survival and that overall survival was identical, whether you got your transplant early um, with the patients alive after five years at 81 percent um, versus those with RBD alone, in which the total number of patients alive was 79 percent. Obviously, this was actually uh, effectively identical. Um, what was also very important was that in the delayed uh, transplant group, 28 percent of patients had received delayed transplant. 72% had actually received other treatments with next generation novel therapies and monoclonal antibodies. And the follow up on this was quite mature with a median follow up of 76 months. So whilst we've got to be careful and say there's got to be longer follow up to be clear on this survival signal, nonetheless, to date, um, we see striking PFS benefit in favor of early transplant, um, but we don't see a survival difference. Um, so this is important, obviously, as we consider patient choices going forward. Now, what about responses? Well, in terms of responses, we were very gratified to see data that really correlated with what we had seen in our earlier studies, where complete response or better was surprisingly similar, actually, uh, around 47% for the early transplant group versus 42% um, for the RVD alone recognize the impact of lenalidomide maintenance in both arms really contributing to this. Um, and also the same applied to very good partial response or better at 83% versus 80%. And overall response rates were 97.5% and 95%. So in the phase three setting, the um, translation of the early phase one, two results to phase three were very consistent with RVD, which was, uh, I think, very encouraging. But when we looked at duration of response, we were struck by the fact that those who received early transplant clearly had a substantial gain in duration of response at around 56 months versus 39 months um, for, um, for the RVD alone arm. Now, we did a very important correlative science study in M, what we call minimal residual disease. And this was led by my colleague, Nikhil Munshi, and um, my colleague, Mehmet Samoa. And what Nikhil and Mehmet showed was that in our preliminary analyses, those who were MRD negative um, were 54% in the early transplant group versus 40% in the RBD alone group. This was statistically significantly trending in the direction in favor of early transplant, um, but hasn't quite achieved statistical significance because the numbers are relatively small at about 100 patients in each group analyzed to date. Um, the important message though, was that if you achieved MRD negativity, regardless of which arm you were assigned to either early transplant or delayed, you did just as well. So this was an incredibly important observation in my view, because it helps us understand that MRD may be able to allow us to guide uh, treatment choices um, going forward, but more data to follow on that. So with all this exciting data, what we then see um, in terms of side effects, and what was important to note is that we did see higher rates of side effects with the RVD and early transplant, um, and when we looked at severe treatment-related side effects, including mucositis, um, infections, and fatigue, we noted that um, overall, 94% uh, of patients undergoing early transplant encountered this versus around 
um, for those folks who'd got RBD alone. And this was at least one or more significant event. Now, obviously, these importantly, however, were manageable, and that's a key message. So challenging as these side effects might be with early transplant, they did prove manageable. And the rates of treatment-related mortality uh, were 0.3% for the RBD alone arm, which was very good, versus around 1.6% for early transplant, which obviously was higher, but also very low. Um, and so again, an area of importance and key interest, but, but vital to consider. And when we looked at long-term signals in terms of tolerability and survival, what we showed was there that there was a higher incidence of acute myeloid leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome seen for the early transplant group. We saw 10 patients encounter this challenge versus none in the RBD alone arm. So this was an important distinction, but overall, we did not see any major difference in any secondary cancers uh, at around 11% for the early transplant arm versus around 10% for the RBD alone. Um, and when we looked at hematologic cancers, it was around three and a half percent for early transplant versus around 1.6% for RVD alone. And this was not statistically significantly different, but an important trend that we need to keep an eye on. Now, vitally, from the point of view of quality of life, um, what we were able to show is that patients who underwent early transplant did experience a significant um, fall in their quality of life across the transplant uh, process around three months or so of this big drop of around 11 points, which in the quality of life metric is, is highly significant. The very good news, though, is that this recovered and actually rebounded um, to above baseline um, in the context of maintenance. And I think this reflects in part the fact that patients are enjoying um, being disease-free for longer in that setting. But I do think as we counsel patients, it's important to note that this quality of life drop is substantial. And on average, in the context of this study where we looked at over 300 patients in both arms, um, you know, per arm, I should say, over 300, doing their quality of life questionnaires, for which we were most grateful, we were able to see that in the context of the rigor of this data set, this, um, this very substantial loss of quality of life is an area which we should continue to focus on and try and improve. Having said that, it was critically transient and it did get better over time. So um, certainly important uh, to bear in mind. So um, with this in mind, what are our implications of the study? Well, I think that clearly our findings confirm progression-free survival benefit for using early transplant and first-line treatment, absolutely clear-cut. And I think that therefore reaffirms transplant as a standard of care in the setting of triplet therapy, especially for younger fit patients. Um, what's really important to note, and this is absolutely critical, is the clinical benefit to patients of receiving lenalidomide maintenance until progression, not for a fixed period, but until progression. And we did this compared to our French partners, where they only had one year, and we were able to do a pre-specified protocol comparison where we looked at this. And if you gave lenalidomide maintenance until progression, you gained about a year uh, in terms of progression-free survival um, for the RVD alone patients versus almost 20 months um, for um, the patients getting RVD plus early transplant. Um, so this really, I think, confirms lenalidomide maintenance until progression as a standard of care. Now, I think why this then is so important to bear in mind overall is whilst these are the best results seen with either approach, either with the early transplant or transplant kept in reserve to date in this setting, the absence of a survival gain for the early transplant group means that patients have a choice. And essentially what's so important to note is that only 28% of our patients got a transplant in the delayed arm so far. Now that's really critical because what it means is, unlike our French partners where it was the opposite, that almost 80% of the patients received transplant in the delayed arm and saw identical survival. This tells us our novel therapies are providing excellent salvage options. And so I think patients really have a choice. Having said that, clearly, if uh, a situation in any particular patient's case is suggesting that high-dose melphalan would be important in controlling their disease, clearly this data support that approach. Um, so the choice is therefore there for patients. Personalized approaches to myeloma therapy can become, I think, much more um, in the front of our, of, our, of our minds as we go forward, because Obviously, we now have comparative toxicity data, including the secondary uh, leukemia signal and quality of life. And this can further inform patient choices and provider recommendations. And I think this is so vital because obviously we designed this trial 12 years ago. Plus, now with the advent of monoclonal antibodies given to the triplet backbone, 
treatments have improved that much more. And whilst we've been able to show that transplant similarly improves outcome for the quadruplets, fascinatingly, we're seeing MRD rates from the quadruplets that are very similar to the MRD rates for the quadruplets plus transplant. Now, how this transplant trans translates into progression-free survival benefit and otherwise remains to be seen. But I do think um, the uh, future for our newly diagnosed patients continues to look much brighter based upon all of this data. And I also want to conclude with one final point around MRD, that I think MRD or minimal residual disease testing in this upfront setting, especially as part of protocols, has potential real value in allowing us to be adaptive in how we uh, uh, go forward um, with our treatment choices for our patients. I just want to close by finally acknowledging uh, and, and above all acknowledging all of those key uh, people who contributed to the success of this study. And I think above all, the first and foremost are our patients and their families. But I also want to acknowledge all 56 centers who are really wonderful, are wonderful partners in the study. Follow-up is ongoing. Uh, obviously, there is a lot more information still coming from the trial from correlative science, including whole genome sequencing to understand um, the genetic profile of patients and how um, their outcomes are affected by this. But all of this would not be possible without, for example, the um, sponsorship and support of the Clinical Trials Network, the so-called BMT-CTN. We also had the endorsement of my um, wonderful colleagues on the Myeloma Alliance Committee and the Alliance itself. And in the same context, we had superb partnership with Pharma, in particular, Celgene BMS, and of course, Millennium uh, Takeda. But without the support, in particular, Celgene BMS and Millennium, we would never have been able um, to do this trial. In that same context, we had great uh, support from the NIH and NCI for our correlative science. And indeed, we also had um, vital support um, from the FDA um, in actually helping us with the regulatory aspects of the trial. And, and my last comment would simply be that underpinning this was actually wonderful philanthropy um, from actually the RJ Corman uh, Multiple Myeloma Research Fund, um, which provided vital support also to other areas of, of financing the study. So a truly amazing team effort um, to get um, the, uh, the trial across the goal line. Uh, and we really look forward to next steps. Uh, and we are in the process of building so-called determination two, um, which will be uh, our next evaluation of how best to improve outcome um, for patients. And thank you very much again.